for the third Sunday of Easter. The first reading is from the Acts of the Apostles. When the captain and the court officers had brought the apostles in and made them stand before the Sanhedrin, the high priest questioned them. We gave you strict orders, did we not, to stop teaching in that name? Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and want to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles said in reply, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus, though you had him killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to grant Israel repentance and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things, as is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. The Sanhedrin ordered the apostles to stop speaking in the name of Jesus and dismissed them. So they left the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they had been found worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name. The second reading is from the book of Revelation. I, John, looked and heard the voice of many angels who surrounded the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They were countless in number, and they cried out in a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches, wisdom and strength, honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, and under the earth and in the sea, everything in the universe, cry out, To the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor, glory and might, for ever and ever. The four living creatures answered, Amen, and the elders fell, fell down and worshipped. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. May the spirit of the risen Christ be in our minds, in our hearts, that the wisdom of the gospel may penetrate the depths of our life. At that time, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Together with Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, Zebedee's sons, two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will come with you. So they went out, they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When it was already dawn, Jesus was standing on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you caught anything to eat? They answered him, no. So he said to them, cast the net over the right side of the boat and you will find something. So they cast it and they were not able to pull it in because of the number of fish. So the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tucked in his garment for he was lightly clad and he jumped into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, for they were not far from the shore, only about a hundred yards, dragging the net with the fish. When they climbed out on the shore, they saw a charcoal fire with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you just caught. So Simon Peter went over and dragged the net ashore full of 153 large fish. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they realized it was the Lord. Jesus came over and took the bread and gave it to them and in like manner the fish. This was now the third time Jesus was revealed to his disciples after being raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon Peter answered him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. He then said to Simon Peter a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon Peter answered him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was distressed that Jesus had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Amen, amen, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. 
But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. He said this signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had said this, he said to him, follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. You probably realized as I was reading through that, this is a, this is a kind of epilogue in the Gospel of John. It really, the Gospel really sort of formally ended with the reading at the resurrection night when Jesus appears and empowers them to bring forgiveness into the world. You probably realized how densely symbolic this is. This is not just the sort of ordinary story being recounted. And we don't have the time, nor do I think today is the best time, to try to go through all of the symbolism, the symbolism of the fish and the bread and Jesus feeding the bread and almost the echoes of other parts of the gospel, like you, when you hear Peter leaping into the water in the place of the risen Christ, you're reminded of the other scene, almost like that, in the, in the uh, synoptic gospels, where Peter tries to walk to Jesus on the water and fails, and, so, and this time he does not. It's full of things like that. It's even full of just some references and proverbs about what it's like to be old, uh, you know, when some, a day will come, just the sadness of old age. Uh, I should probably mention, I don't know if I'm a kind of spectacle, but part of being old is I'm visibly in me these days. I'm having some, as you can see, some problems uh, walking and things, which comes from an advanced an advanced old age, um, an advancing old age, I suppose I should say. Anyway, the, God, the homily today is actually going to be in two parts, and one part of it is going to be uh, all gestures, but it's part of the homily. The homily, the second part of the homily, the first part will be a brief, my talking fairly briefly, the second part will be the baptism of Milo Thomas, and the formal entrance into the communion with the Catholic Church of Genesis of Winsett and her receiving the sacrament. This is, they really are part of the homily today, and they fit, interestingly, with the readings, which just happen to be the readings for the day that we could do these, this baptism and reception into the church. In the Old Testament, there was a form of prophecy, and I... I don't remember the technical term for it, but a prophet, as you know, is somebody who speaks for God, somebody who reveals the presence of God. In the Old Testament, a prophet is not somebody who predicts the future. He's one who uncovers the presence of God in the experience that people are having. And most prophecies, obviously, are speaking. The great prophets read, and it's all contained in those books in the, in the Old Testament. But there were actually other forms that even those great prophets used, which were actions and gestures. Maybe the most famous was Hosea, who married a prostitute as a prophecy about God's affection for the people who had betrayed him and had betrayed that he, even though they had prostituted themselves, broken the covenant, he loved them and would make a deeper commitment to him. Jeremiah and Ezekiel, there were things about breaking sticks, about acting as if you were going into exile. There was always the gesture and then the words which allowed the people to see these gestures as expressing the mystery of God. So the gestures are going to be the baptism and the confirmation, the entering the faith and confirmation. The words I'm, I'm doing right now. Uh, and these gestures, it's not just arbitrary that I decided to say that this baptism and confirmation are prophetic in this community. It's precisely because who's being baptized and who's being confirmed. It has something to do with the mystery of the life in this community. Milo's parents, Heidi and Josh Waterfall, uh, were married in this community some years ago, certainly more than how old? five years ago. Uh, I was there, I should remember. It. And they already have one son, Henry, who has been vocalizing uh, for a while here and has now left us for a while. Uh, and now the second son, Milo. They came, they were both uh, postdocs uh, when they were married, uh, Heidi out of the University of Chicago, Josh from here, and they have continued that. 
And now they bring their second son. In a few years, maybe sooner than that, they will, in the natural course of things of, of academic life, be leaving this community to go on. But what I was thinking of when I was thinking about, because we also baptized Henry here uh, a few years ago, uh, is that when they made the commitment to marry each other in this community, they actually, in that ordinary human commitment, they also discovered that they had committed themselves to a larger reality, and in which they have contributed a lot over these years to the Catholic community here, to other people, helping other people who are preparing for marriage in all kinds of ways, in studying together with some of us over the years. They have their life, their marriage together, and now their son is a kind of pathetic expression, if you would, of what it's like in a human community to make a human commitment, but then to live it at its depth, to discover in a love that they had discovered for one another a love that took them beyond that. The same thing is true, actually, in a slightly different way with Jennifer. Many years ago, uh, Jennifer's... Uh, many years ago, I was preaching in this place, and I was on a kind of riff about how so many students at Cornell commit themselves completely to great success at Cornell to, to try to get the best kind of position and the best kind of job and they sacrifice many other things, even many other human things. I was going on about this, that you shouldn't, uh, Cornell should not become an idol. And I said, you know, you do all of this, you spend all of these years, you neglect other things to end up living in Scarsdale. Now for those of you, <laughs> This is a perfect expression. Scottsdale is one of those upper middle class uh, suburban communities around New York City. Anybody who's not from, everybody knows what Scarsdale represents. And a little bit, I was saying, it's not worth the price, actually, of so much else in your life and so much part of developing your faith. Well, I was standing at the door. We used to stand at the door and say goodbye to people then. And one of the students came up to me and said, I live in Scarsdale. <laughs> And I said, well, then you know what I'm talking about. It's not worth it. Well, that was Michael Piscateri. In law school, after he left, he and Jennifer met and fell in love. And the reason Jennifer is entering full communion of church, having had a, a very deep religious life in another Christian community, is because of the life between her, the love between her and Michael, and even connected to that us trying to figure out what it's like to live at Cornell, what it means to live at Cornell, and somebody raising the question that living at Cornell can be done deeply or superficially. It can connect you to something much more profound and real to the presence of the risen Christ or not. The readings today actually, I think, say the same thing. The first reading comments on the, the first reading about Peter standing up in the, in the Sanhedrin and preaching makes you look at the second read, the gospel reading, or the other way around. They comment on each other. Peter, notice the Peter who is, because Peter's the central character in both readings, right? Notice the Peter who is in the first reading. Brave, courageous, deep, understanding. This is the same Peter who rejected Jesus. And in John's Gospel, rejected it. It's not clear. Maybe he rejected it out of fear, although it might have been different kinds of fear. Maybe it was just the kind of fear that, that um, cowardly people like me are afraid of trouble. Or maybe it was a deeper human fear, a fear of the depth of the life he was being called to, like Heidi and Josh were called to, a thing that was revealing, like Michael... Jennifer, who just fell in love on the law school line, you know, called fear of that deeper commitment, those deeper things. Maybe whatever it was, maybe it was just discouragement and an inability to understand, clearly an inability to understand who Jesus was as God in human flesh and why the story of his life, a story ending in failure and rejection, was a story of triumph in John's Gospel. Whatever reason, this is the Peter who rejected him for all of those reasons. And this is the Peter who is now 
profoundly the voice of God calling his own people to be faithful to that covenant. Notice there's a line in there that's very important. He says, this, the God who raised him from the dead, has brought to us repentance and forgiveness. God gave him repentance. It's not that he repented and then got that something. What he discovered was the gift of repentance in his life. And opening himself to that gift, he discovered forgiveness. But what did forgiveness? It didn't just mean that, okay, I forgive you for all the things you've done. We put in big past. Let's go on together. No, no, no. Forgiveness meant it exploded him into a life beyond the life maybe that he was afraid of or he would have been afraid of or the life he couldn't have understood before he recognized and accepted the forgiveness that was in Christ. And I think that that becomes clear when you look at the, that third reading. Peter, do you love me? What? Ask yourself what that question is. I mean, you could read that just very humanly. Maybe that's not a bad thing to do in personal prayer. Little imagination about yourself and stuff. You know, where Jesus, the one who had been rejected and stuff, is now asking him. But that can possibly be what the writer of John's Gospel means. Because the writer of John's Gospel does not see Jesus as just a human being with feelings and things like which he has, but not very much in John's Gospel, more in the others. He sees him as the divine son in human flesh. When, so this is just some suggestions about this, this, these three questions. Okay? They obviously refer to the rejection, but not just, okay, we're going to get over that. Peter, do you love me? Is it a question... And notice Peter's answer. You know that I love you. Is it a question? Is it meant to be a question that is asking Peter to discover the gift of loving Christ, the risen Christ, loving Jesus, the risen Christ, of loving him beyond his failure, of discovering in his sin One of the places where you discover if you live deeply enough, if you live superficially, you'll never meet God. If you live deeply enough, one of the places in your life where you will discover the presence of God is in your sin, in your failure. This is the thing the church is going through right now. In the next months and years, the church has to discover the gift of penitence. Not only personal penitence on the part of all of us, and especially of those who have done the horrific, immoral, and illegal things, but structural penitence. A clericalism that has distorted the way the priesthood should relate to the rest of the church, has distorted where power should be exercised in the church. To discover in yourself, by the question, do you love me? Do we love the risen Christ? It's a question that Josh and Heidi ask each other in their own life, that they, that they will ask it of their children, is it my problem, so it's us. Okay. It's that question, but it's that question at the depth where it becomes prophetic, where an ordinary human life lived deeply enough, willing to live with the question, Christ asking me over and over again, Smith, do you love me? Do you discover in yourself this gift of penitence and commitment so that you begin to live beyond, not just that you get over the bad, the trivial or big bad things you do, but that you begin to live at this level where you are actually the one, the ones whom Christ is sending into the world to be him and to do what he did. So we're about, as we're watching the gestures of this prophecy today, I'm sure you feel very uncomfortable being called prophets, but then you probably hope anyway. A little embarrassing, but it's not embarrassing. It reminds us that who we are, we we mentioned all these ordinary stories that are in this room, all of them, today, you should see your life through Peter and Christ who asked them, through Josh and Heidi and Milo and Michael and Jennifer.